Right. So, hi, everyone, and thanks for having yes. me, Jesper. I'm uh, Dari Golbu. I'm principal content designer on the Forma team. And in my role, I focus a lot on onboarding and in-product learning, which means that, among other things, I work with uh, all our product teams to help them communicate their multiple product updates, making sure our users don't miss any important feature or update and get to experience as it comes up in our product. So today, I'll be happy to co-present with Jesper and walk you through the latest and greatest. And we have a lot to talk about today. Yeah, and we're already uh, running over schedule. So I guess we just did that again. <laughs> have to talk very fast. <laughs> All right. So uh, since we launched, our focus areas have been around doing better design tools. It's been around better hub management. It's been around more analysis to help decision support. We focus a lot on enabling an open ecosystem, which I think is really cool. And we're constantly chasing more databases to connect to. That is kind of the key themes. And so since launch in, uh, what should you say, May, May 8th? May 8th, yeah. yeah. Autodesk Form has released 72 updates. That is 3.7 updates a week on average. And that is in, in the middle of summer vacation and everything. How, did you have any vacation at all? Okay, I did, but I admit it's been really busy and uh, we've been rolling out tons of updates. But on the other hand, that's how we roll. Mm. We constantly release improvements. And once we feel that it can deliver value to our user base, we put it out there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about better features and how important it is uh, for us to get your feedback. But anyway, since Fulma is a cloud product, whenever something new goes live, you don't have to install upgrade anything, you get access to the latest features immediately as they appear in the product. So all of this 72 updates that we're going to talk about are already available for you in the product. That is awesome. Let's dig into the, the mainliners or the best stuff first. So we just released the solar energy beta. What's that all about? So this is a uh, hot of the press pun intended, as this is the uh, latest addition to our uh, ever growing suite of sustainability tools. And this analysis helps you estimate the potential of generating energy from the sun. And uh, in addition to calculating what happens if you install solar panels uh, on the roofs and facades of uh, your buildings, it also estimates how much uh, solar energy meets your site which allows you to prevent certain overheating pro problems and uh, make decisions early on instead of having to fix some uh, mistakes later on in the process. Yeah, because that's what I love. It's it's from day one, right? It's you you sort of you start a project, you put on it some massing, and immediately you're starting to see, oh, should I consider this or not? And as an architect, I know I think most of us have kind of have these thoughts and conversations about how do I implement solar panels into my project? Should it be a priority or should I do something else? And too often, the data insight that makes you make a decision on this happens way downstream and you're kind of stuck in this limbo. So this is putting it up front and center. But this is just new. So yes, this is this is really recent and uh, currently it has a beta tag in it. And I'll just quickly comment on what this means. So once we've verified that a feature brings value, we'll put it out there as better for you to try out. But this means that we're still actively working on some improvements and things will be changing very quickly. So it can be user interface improvements, performance improvements, but it's out there for you to try out. And it's more important for us than ever to hear what you think. So if you have any ideas of how this can be improved, so it really brings value to your projects, please get in touch with us in the community forum or in our in-product chat, which is, by the way, answered by our product team. So it's a direct line to those who are actually delivering this feature. Mm. And any feedback on new, pro new stuff is, is just so important early on, right? Uh, we absolutely. Immediately, as soon as it gives value, we put it out there and then we start listing, right? Yes, indeed. Cool. So you also released the first version of New Explorer. Yes, I think this is super exciting. And since I mentioned I work a lot with onboarding, I think this is a tool that can bring a lot of value to those who are just experiencing Forma in their early days because it can quickly demonstrate the power of the tool in terms of running quick massing studies. So what this tool uh, helps you achieve is based on some parameters, you can quickly generate different massing options for your site. And you can assess uh, the sense of density and where you want to take this further so that you can then refine the concept with uh, other design tools. And this is obvious as an architect, this is not architecture. This is pre-architecture. This is a understanding of a density of a site that is a if I have this kind of coverage on the site, how big do I have to be? So you can sort of like sort of start to understand it. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it allows you to gauge things early on. And this is a massive, massive time saver in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we're listening to user feedback, apropos user feedback. So now we've also included the ability to generate roads and vegetation, which allows you to have a look at this massing study a bit more holistically. Mm -hmm. And it gives a sort of sense of scale and an entourage, which I think is uh, really uh, useful to understanding your site. Because then you suddenly are like, oh, this is actually really big or this is really small, right? Uh, and then, you know, the big brother to our little rapid uh, noise analysis was released as well in beta as well, right? Yes, that's that's correct. So the detailed noise analysis is now out there helping you design calmer cities and optimize for better living conditions. As we know, cities can get uh, pretty noisy. Uh, it uh, Previously, you could use the rapid analysis to get quick insights to validate your design decisions and get this directional understanding of where you should take your concept further. But now you can dive into deeper insight, insights with a detailed um, noise analysis. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's as an architect, this is one of those layers you know exists, but you can't visually see normally, right? You, you know there's traffic, you know there's noise, but you don't know how traffic impacts noise. Or you, you maybe intuitively know that this kind of street is noisy, changing it to a pedestrian street is going to help. But this thing gives you a data insight so that when you are, say, uh, arguing to change the speed limit of a street next to your in your development, or you are wondering what happens if traffic doubles in the next 20 years, because mm -hmm. you are designing for the next, I wouldn't even say 20, the next 100 years, right? You can sort of see what is going to happen down the line. And I have to admit, like, if if somebody told me that I would be interested in noise analysis as an architect five to 10 years ago when I was working in my studio, I would, I would probably disagree. But now understanding more about how traffic impact noise and how noise impacts buildings, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm feeling better equipped to have those conversations with my traffic consultant, my noise consultant, my municipality, my developers around why we are doing the stuff we are mm -hmm. doing as architects. This is great to hear. And again, you can get all these insights early on without involving an acoustician, which might sometimes come into your project much later. But then again, you can preempt certain problems before you've made a lot of, you've put a lot of effort into the project and just uh, fix some issues before they arise. Yeah, and that's the best situation to be in where you, you maybe you even discover a question or a problem you cannot solve, but you have the, the capacity to ask the right questions. So that is just a power tool for architects. It's bringing specialty tools to the, the architect. And right? making it, making this accessible and yeah. understandable. Yeah. And what I think, speaking of sort of uh, cool combinations, what I think is really cool is that with the rapid noise analysis or any rapid analysis together with Explore, you can actually use Explore options and change them and immediately get a call and answer response to what happens on ground if I put massing this way, mm. what happens to, on ground if I put massing this way. So, little uh, architect hacky trick here if you really want to like elevate your explore explorations pun intended yeah shall i quickly just explain uh, the difference between rapid and detail please do yeah so as i mentioned uh, rapid analysis provides you instant insights uh and uh, you can use this uh as the directional input for where to take your proposal further and it's based on uh, thousands uh, of simulations run in the detailed analysis. And this is uh, based on machine learning. While the detailed analysis then takes local environmental data into consideration and provides uh, more precise insights that take a little bit longer time to calculate, but that will probably come into action when your concept has already matured mm. um, a bit more. So it's a real simulation versus a yeah. machine learning estimation. That's, Indeed. That's really cool. Um, one of the big things that we've been working with a lot since launch is our own 3D sketch tool. Yeah, yeah, there is a lot to unpack here. So I'd say it's one of the biggest wins for our entire product team is that we got access to the format intellectual property. And with this, we also get a team of fantastic, talented developers who are ready to unleash the conceptual design capabilities directly in format. And I think if we had a scoreboard of who released the most updates, these folks would have gotten the golden medal because they released 12 updates 12. since May. Yeah, Jeez. isn't that crazy? That is a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, so uh, 3D Sketch currently resides in a sub mode, which means that after you've started designing masses in the main design mode, you can dive deeper into detail oh, and, really like and unleash the conceptual design tools in the 3D Sketch sub mode. Mm -hmm. So these sub modes, why do we, why do we use sub modes? 
So currently, I would say it represents the level of detail. And as I mentioned, you start with a massing mm -hmm. in the main design mode. And then depending on what you'd like to focus on, you dive into 3D sketch to add the conceptual forms. Uh, and then you can also use the floor plan sketcher to add detailing and uh, plan the uh, floor layouts. However, with 3D sketch, based on user feedback, we're hoping to bring some of its capabilities close into the main design mode because there it makes the most sense for the workflow of the architects, mm. which you can probably uh, speak for. Yeah, the, you know, we're, we're, it's not all, not all flat roofs and, and tall buildings. But that's usually where we start with this blocking and massing. But then, mm eventually you are going to want to actually build some architecture in it. And that is my favorite workflow really is starting out these basic buildings and calling them basic is really doing I don't think it's service. fair yet because there is quite a bit of functionality included mm. in those. But it's such a great starting point to sort of mass out your, your, your rough densities or your rough needs and then start to think about, okay, so what is the architecture I'm looking for? And what happens if I if I've curved this corner? What happens if I have these kind of slanted roofs? What what if I do balustrades or arcades or balconies? How does that impact my architecture? So it's a next step upgrade uh, in everything you do in Forma, and I love that that's just like built directly in. Right. Yeah, and it looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a gorgeous. Uh... It's a gorgeous piece of tech. And I'm so glad that we actually are getting more and more of these features and these people are just pushing on. Yeah, it's developing really, really fast. Uh, so much fun. Anyway, um, another thing and talking about ecosystems, extensions in Forma, what's that? This is super exciting because this is really new to Forma and uh, Autodesk is currently building an open ecosystem for architecture, engineering and constructions and we're walking the talk. Uh, so currently, in addition to the capabilities that are native to Forma, you can also tap into other capabilities or analysis or other functions uh, brought in by third party developers, partners or other internal teams, or maybe even standalone architects who have a fantastic idea of how Forma functionality could be extended. So you're saying anyone can kind of get into it? Yes, absolutely. We currently have a lot of documentation and we're doing a lot of evangelism, helping get started, but there is a self-serve environment where you can add your extension test it out and open it to the world at some point point. and we do have some examples of uh, oh yes already. Yeah. so one of the extensions that we made it was the rhino to forma extension and that is made internally by us here at autodesk and uh, it sort of serves as a proof of concept i, I would say where so what what do we do with that so this is currently still in beta, uh, just a full disclaimer, but this already adds a lot of value. Uh, this extension connects Rhinoceros 3D by our friends at McNeil Group and Associates. Uh, and uh, it allows you to bring your former model with existing site limits, bring it to Rhino, work on it there and feed it back to former without sending any files back and forth. So it's a, it's a data streaming. It's, there's no import, no export. No, no, that's uh, no fuss with that at all. And uh, you can uh, experience the power of outcome-based design in Forma. So run the analysis and act on that accordingly. And that is that is the exciting part, right? It's like if you if you sort of live and breathe Rhino commands, or you need NURBS to do your work, then you should definitely use Rhino, and then you should send it to Forma and use Forma for the stuff that enhances your workflow, right? Yeah, I see you're pretty excited about that. Yeah, I uh, I used to be excited about Rhino way back, but it's been a while since I've been using it a lot professionally. Uh, that is made by us. We also have examples of workflows made by others. Yes. Uh, Forma allows you to create parking in the buildings, but we did not support the possibility to create parking on terrain. And since we didn't have it, then... Uh, find it uh, externally and who if not test fit are the gurus when it comes to generating parking <laughs> and with this in mind they created this extension and they're one of the first third-party providers to create extensions that are currently available in Forma. and now you can uh, leverage that in uh, you can access the extensions from the sidebar install these extensions and unleash the power of parking generation oh man and that is just one small piece of test fit so i'm excited to see if if they'll be releasing more extensions to Forma in the future yeah, there's a lot of potential out there for sure. Okay, let's go. Let's get into data. So Australia. Yes, shout out to our listeners from Australia, but uh, now you get better terrain service. And we went from 20 meters to five meters resolution, which I think is a huge improvement. And the visuals over there on the screen neatly display the before and after state. 
And I think there will be a few out there who will be pleased about this update. Yeah, I know there's a lot of Australians who've been keen on getting it started, and I'm so glad we could source a better data source. We also have fed uh, some better data into yes, Canada. Yes, great news for Canada as well. And here, the quality is even better. We're talking about one to two meters resolution. And uh, ideally, if we find a data provider with that quality, uh, we aim to get to that level of resolution. And in case of Canada, since we're always on the lookout for data providers with high quality data, we figured out that the uh, National Mapping Agency in Canada already had high quality data. So it took us just a couple of hours of work to integrate it and it was a no brainer. Mm. And here we go. And I know that it was very well received and it enticed a few users to come back to Forma. Because this update. is, yeah. And because this is one of the things I've heard a lot about uh, feedback on Forma is, uh, or maybe people misunderstand is that Forma doesn't have any databases. We just connect to existing databases, right? And so we are looking for anything free, of course, but, Ideally, those, yeah. but those often come with licensing or maybe they're not exportable. And then there's also providers who sell their services. But there's a huge difference between countries and uh, the way these APIs are. So we're always on the hunt. Yes, indeed. And with this, I think I would mention that if you have a suggestion for a data provider in your country that you think would add value, it's not currently supported in Forma, please send us a tip. In the data order model, there is a contact us option and we'll be very happy to find out. And otherwise, also to remind you that it's possible to uh, import your terrain data from, for example, InfraWorks and pick it up from there. That is true. And, you know, in a uh, best case scenario, uh, we find uh, services like Datafusening in, in Denmark, right? Yeah, good news for our Nordic friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, this is more precise information about property boundaries. And uh, since Forma allows you to start designing your project from an informed position, among other things, this means that it's placed in real world context. So you have all this data and then you can start building upon, uh, on top of that. Yeah, if only the whole world had this kind of data maturity, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the goal eventually. <laughs> but circling back to uh, free data sources, one of our sort of uh, global and favorite data sources has been OpenStreetMaps. Right, and you've done some uh, magic with that. Yes, indeed. So we're fetching existing building data from OpenStreetMaps, and there was a catch with that. Uh, we did not always know what the height of the buildings was, so it was defaulted to three meters, which realistically like doesn't make right? much sense. Yeah. Uh, so now we improved the algorithm for how we estimate the height of buildings. We take the number of floors into consideration, and we multiply it by three meters. So the data quality has significantly improved. Because hmm, what we actually got from OpenStreetMap was the footprint, and it may be an attribute that told you that this is four floors. Yes, correct. Or seven floors, or maybe not even that. So now we're actually reading the, the floor data and adding three times that to give a rough estimate. Yeah, so this is uh, way less manual work adjusting those existing buildings to actually uh, get it into the conditions around your site. Really cool. Uh, let's see, let's move on to in-product stuff. So we did uh, stats for detailed wind and microclimate analysis. I think seeing is believing, and now it's even easier to interpret results of the detailed analysis. And as you can see, there are all sorts of visual aids with the charts, graphs, and color bars to help you interpret those results. And it ranges from, for example, for the wind, it's uh, speed distribution and comfort categories. Uh, and for the microclimate analysis, it's temperature distributions and so on. And just a little tip, since I wouldn't remember off the cuff every single detail that is included in the analysis, in the top right corner, you can see the inspect tool. By enabling this tool, you can click specific points on your site to get targeted results for those specific points to get this even more detailed snapshot of what's going on there. And I know at least some of the experts sitting in the Q&A back here worked a lot with the microclimate and it's shaping up really nicely. But it's the perceived temperature, right? So Correct, it's not the yes. actual temperature, but it's what it feels like. Yes, yes. Which, as we saw last summer in the heat waves, is actually really important in urban yeah, situations. Yeah, it, it is becoming more and more relevant, yeah. for sure. So these circle graphs are just beautiful. I'm so glad we're adding more stats into as we go now. So we've also done time interval filtering on the sun analysis. Sun hours analysis allows you to see how many hours different uh, parts of your buildings are exposed to the sun. But to add even more precision to that, you're able to not only select a date, so on what day of the year it's most relevant for you to run this analysis, but also narrow it down to specific time intervals. It's in the detailed analysis view. I'm manipulating this filter in the right panel. You can get to this level of uh, 
laser view, I would say. And why, you know, what as an architect, the reason why this is important is because if you are designing homes and you want to have sunny balconies, then you also need to think about when when are these homes being used. So you probably want to look for good places to put your balconies after four in the afternoon when you're actually home, as opposed to, well, I guess we're all working from home, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so this kind of filtering uh, just helps you like really, really dig into what is that, what is it I am looking for. But even though it's a quite a granular filter and you can, you can sort by hours of sun exposure, I heard we're already getting feedback on, on changes we need to do. Oh yeah, there are some users who want to narrow down the ability to filter to 15 minutes. Feature request. <laughs> Feature request, and that is the Polish market. And the fun part about this, and this is why we always go with, you know, we, we release and then we listen, because for us in our markets and our bias, then one hour was plenty for us to sort of uh, get the granularity we needed. It turns out in, in Polish markets or Polish regulations, it's a 15 minute window. So that feedback is important for us so we can listen and react. Yeah, this is the constant feedback loop for their yeah. audience because we'll learn about different use case and some local flavor to different needs when it comes to analysis and so on. Yeah. And speaking of local flavors, well, why do we need the ability to add the edit analysis colors? On the way to customization, we've added the ability to adjust the color scale depending on what the requirements are in your specific market or maybe you have some custom requirements for your project. You can adjust where the borders of each category lie so that it's displayed accordingly for your analysis. That makes sense. So if you can sort of say that everything below this standard is red, so I kind of see it obviously and then sort it from there. We've also added zone filtering of area metrics. Area metrics are super important because they provide a snapshot of the key stats related to your buildings. And if you have certain requirements related to zoning, if you need to achieve a certain percentage of residential space, area metrics are the way to go. Uh, but previously, it was only possible to see the stats for your entire site. Uh, and it was not possible to take a zoomed in look at certain uh, parts of the site. But now with the zones, the zone filtering, you can um, see area metrics for those specific zones. And for example, if your project goes over several phases, you can see what it looks for phase one, for phase two, and use zones accordingly. Yeah, several phases is a very good use case. Another use case would be, say, you have a kindergarten that has specific needs. You can sort of filter that out as a zone and keep an eye on that specifically, right? Uh, a pro tip here is uh, if you want to analyze more than just your site, just create a, a you know, the bigger the zone, the more more stress the computer gets mm. or the, the cloud computers get. Uh, but you can really like start looking at neighbors or neighborhoods or mm. specific areas around your site as well. So that is a, a good tip. Cool, cool, cool tip. And camera positions. Just when I thought it couldn't get more exciting, I think we're getting to some really uh, exciting things. Uh, I would say that this particular update is extremely important for the storytelling aspect of Forma. Mm. And if you're preparing to, for example, walk your stakeholders or walk your team members through a proposal, you can prepare by saving specific camera position and then supplement different uh, points of your narrative by showing views from those specific camera positions. And uh, you can find those settings in the lower right corner of the canvas. And you even added a tiny animation that jumps between the cameras, which looks really cool uh, and impressive in presentations. Good here. <laughs> but there's also the need to sort of bring it out, right? Yeah. And if you're presenting outside of Forma, you can take screen captures from the design mode. Previously, this was only supported for the detailed analysis, but based on feedback, we've also added the same feature in the design mode. So you can just include them directly into your presentation, PDF reports, whatnot. And the difference here between just screenshotting your screen and grabbing the 4K uh, uh, screen capture, which you know, I guess it's in the name, right? It's a 4K capture. So you can really get that crisp, nice uh, screenshot even on a smaller screen. And this is what it would look like if this stream was 4K, but it's not. So you should try it out. That's my tip. <laughs> it looks good here. Yeah, looks great on our screen. Um, reference image import, that's a big one. It was a very, very popular request as well. And we know that many architects uh, import reference images, for example, a 2D sketch that existed elsewhere, or maybe a zoning plan to then be able to trace over it or use it. Well as the name says, as a reference. So now, now you can import a JPG or a PNG file and use it uh, as reference when you're designing your former project. Uh, that is solving a user need so much. Yeah. And since things are moving fast, we've already improved it. Yeah. And uh, we got some feedback about uh, scaling and uh, placing it on your site. And now this is even smoother. Yeah. 
And I think this is a good step in the right direction. I still have feedback on this, uh, but you guys should also give us feedback on that and let us know what you need. Because uh, this is solving like 90% of my use cases, but I've got 10% which could Well, you're a user that is hard to please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. But glad we can get feedback from you as an architect as well, not only as a peer on the team. Right. Give an inch and I'll take the arm. <laughs> Show 2D elements and terrain textures. That was one of the things that really annoyed me for a while. Yeah, I would say that this is from a technical standpoint, might be a tiny update, but experience wise mm. and uh, in the flow, uh, in the workflow that architects have in Forma, this is quite significant. Uh, in the lower right corner of the canvas, you can use different visualization of uh, terrain, uh, map, or satellite view. So 2D elements were not previously displayed in satellite view, which was fairly annoying because let's say you've added a site limit, it's important in order to make further decisions, but it just doesn't display there. Well, now it does. Yeah, perfect. Fixed it. Thank you. Yay. Okay, let's get into the nerdy stuff. So we've added a look from tool. And uh, this is a, a hidden upgrade, which I, we probably should be talking louder about. So it's control L uh, or in the bottom uh, right side of the screen. And you can click any point on your project and get a look from option. And you can then uh, pan back and forth as if you were standing there. So we've, we're, we're very good at these kind of like high level mm -hmm. aerial shots. This tool helps you really get into your project and start to understand it from a, a ground level. Yeah, I think this gives a better sense of scale, how the space feels, uh, how could it look with the trees in it and also supplement the storytelling oh. aspects eventually. And save the camera position and you kind of jump up and down. It's really cool. You should check that out. Uh, we also added a hotkey for switching between 2D and 3D. I mean, you could always click 2D and 3D in the bottom, but sometimes you just want to hotkey for everything. So uh, click P and you'll uh, jump between perspective and flat, I guess. Is yeah, that... one of those uh, efficiency hacks, yeah. I would say. And that's basically just because the user wanted it. And we're like, yeah, sure. And we delivered. One of my favorite hidden features is within 3D Sketch, uh, the ability to isolate an element or a building or whatever you're focusing on by clicking the hotkey H. So you hide your context because sometimes mm. you just want to look at the one thing you're designing. Mm. At other points, you may want to see your context, mm. but there's a lot of hotkeys. Yeah, but that goes back to my point about the level of detail and it allows you to really, really take this uh, laser view on that particular yeah. element. So instead of just like saving this webinar and rewatching it every time you need to remember a hotkey, we added a quick access search. Yeah, so you can locate it in the lower left corner when you're working in the design mode. You'll see a neat menu where you can search different actions and particularly relevant for what you're doing now and find the relevant hotkeys, and it's a massive time saver, I would say. Mm -hmm. And very well hidden down there. Yeah, I think uh, we might have another look at that <laughs> or be more loud at promoting this. And this thing reminds me that so many of you developers are on uh, MacBooks because this is such a iOS feature, it looked like. Oh, guilty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, my MacBook made it on your Windows. Uh... Yeah, I'm not, I, sh I should never trash Mac again. Out. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I have this one, huh? So we have a lot of users that are uh, in classic projects from, from way back when. Mm. And uh, at some point, uh, people decided it's time to upgrade. And one of the things that you have done, that, which I think is really cool, is you've built this upgrade tool. So when a, when a project is ready to be upgraded from classic to standard former projects, there's a click by click where you can sort of like select, bring these members, bring these proposals and build a standard project out of a classic one. I think that's, that tool is really great if you're on the point where you want to upgrade. Yeah, that's right. So those of you who have been with us before May 8th might have those classic projects, but now it's a completely stress-free transition to bring the proposals into standard form of projects. And of course, we'll realize that learning the new user interface might be a little bit stressful. So we try to make that guide step-by-step step as self-explanatory as possible and you can pick up your work in a standard form of project. And fair warning, there are some differences between what you can actually bring with you as, and some may prefer to stay in classic for, for a while longer and you can ask, ask for, for an extension to use classic I think currently until the end of the year or so. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but what we are seeing is, you know, uh, hopefully what you are seeing is that standard is really starting to cake punch above its weight class. 
Yeah, and that's where the continuous stream of updates is happening, mm -hmm. including this 72 we're talking the about 72. today. 72. <laughs> Let's circle back to 3D Sketch. And I'm just going to nerd out here because these are these are my tools. Take the stage. So the, there's a new contextual edge tool in 3D Sketch, which does extrude edges or offsets edges or smooth edges if you want to hide them, which is just helps you do more complex geometries faster. So I'm really glad they, they, they brought this into 3D Sketch. Some people probably know it from Format. And this is fun when you have a Formit people with knowledge of Formit that they know, oh, this tool is great. Let's just bring it along. Uh, and then they kind of just do it continuously. Same uh, that they, st they started to recognize the, the contextual world of Forma, which I think is a huge strength. So you can start to snap to whatever context you have outside of your 3D sketch environment. So that is really cool. Let's go get into your, your stuff. <laughs> right, so these updates originate from the product team that I'm part of. Mm. And uh, among other things, we focus on the access point to Forma. So if you're the first user from your company and you're first to enter Forma with a license, you'll be asked to create a hub. And the hub is where basically it all starts. It's a collaborative workspace where all your project proposals and team members will reside. And you can go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit more in granular. So, uh, you can decide as an admin whether you would like to keep your hub open or if you want to make it available by request. If it's open, it means that all the colleagues from the same Autodesk account team will uh, see this hub and be able to join it. If you choose it to make it available by request, well, then you will have to approve their access. And then in terms of controlling who sees what, when you create a new project, you can choose to keep it invite only by default, which means that in order to see and collaborate on this project, someone will have to be proactively invited by it. And if you turn that off, well, then those who are invited to the hub will be able to find and join that project. Right. Oh yeah, and finally, if you happen to be part of several teams, then you will be able to choose which of them you want to join in Forma, which makes it pretty visual and uh, you don't get lost and you'll find your way into Yeah, Forma. and this has been important because we've had a lot of users get a little bit lost on the way in, right? Yeah, yeah, we want to just help them get on board as soon as possible so they can start uh, unlocking the value of Forma. Oh, that is a lot. And there's a lot more product updates to go. We're just going to rapid fire the rest uh, for you. Do you want to go first? Yeah, we've structured them a little bit um, by topic, but uh, let's get to it. Um, you can add basic buildings to the library and reuse them further in your proposal so you don't have to create them from scratch every single time. You can add terrain to your library. Uh, in uh, countries such as Norway and Netherlands, terrain da data is now automatically fetched from governmental sources. No need to send files back and forth. 3D Sketch has updated their navigation bar. We've added massive, numerous tool improvements to 3D Sketch, a lot of them, uh, including toggling layers that we briefly touched upon, and also site limit zones and constraints that you've created in the main design mode will also be reflected in 3D Sketch. Uh, if you're interacting with the base layer, which is something that is reused ac across proposals, you will be able to see properties of elements before starting to edit them so you understand what's what. Yeah, and the base layer being everything that's not part of the, the, the building you're, or the proposal you're designing right now. So this, that's the constant world. Yes, I would say the foundation in a way. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, we've tried to make it as easy as possible to swap between base layers and editing them with some new context menus. And swapping between base layers is, I think, is a really strong use case because then you can look at the world if traffic was double versus the world if traffic was as, is it, as it is today, for example. Yeah, so testing out different scenarios and see how your project fits depending mm. on this changing conditions. Mm. Uh, again, to help to make interaction with base layers easier, all elements in it can be hovered over and selected. Oh yeah, I remember for a while they were kind of impossible to click on and it was super annoying. Uh, because you, we had this, uh, I mean, I mean it was still, it's still important that you don't accidentally change something in a base layer but at least being able to hover and select them is sort of a good middle ground. And then you actively have to start editing if you want to change them, right? Small but important fix. Yeah. Uh, visualization of the ground texture has become more crisp and map and satellite view. Yeah, well, that's just a tech upgrade, right? There's no new images or anything. Correct, yeah. Cool. And I think we've covered that. It's, yeah. uh, it's probably a repetition. So in Analyze, 
daylight potential results are not, not displayed on trees anymore. Which didn't make much sense no. when it was displayed on trees. I think the Vulcan architect made fun of us for that, so uh, we fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> we added interpolation and filled transparent gaps for analysis textures in detailed noise analysis. That is just so that it looks better uh, and feels better. And as an architect, like the good graphics there, just, you know, it's important. <laughs> And there's a roughness and wind row source in the wind analysis, right? And there's a bunch of usability improvements in noise analysis because that came out and then they immediately started reacting to feedback and upgraded it. They even added stats and stuff. So that's really cool for the navigation. Yeah, so projects that you interacted with recently will be always displayed at top on the top of the home and projects page. So you can jump straight in without having to find that recent project. We've improved the navigation between proposals. So when you switch between proposals, the entire page doesn't have to reload. So this is pure efficiency, but so the precious seconds are not wasted. Feels good. We've improved the help menu experience. And now you can read help articles directly in the help panel without navigating to a separate browser tab. Check it out. And I think the help menu is, uh, so people assume that you click help and then you get articles and stuff like that. What I really like about the help menu in Forma is that you're actually you can actually reach out and somebody will like pick up the phone virtually. Yes, I think I mentioned early in the webinar that it's our own product teams who are answering all the questions. So you can uh, send your question directly to those who are responsible for the features. Yeah, and Autodesk, this is an active choice by Autodesk to put product people directly in contact with customers there. I love that. In the collaboration field, uh, so these are some improvements related to inviting members. Now you can copy paste emails directly from Outlook into the invite field in uh, the invitation. Oh, that feels good. The invite link is now much, much more visible and it's easier to add it to the clipboard. And admins, uh, in terms of control and visibility, admins are, will be able to join invite-only projects since uh, they need to have an overview of all work happening in the hub. And we tweak the member all descriptions to better reflect who does what, whether you can only edit or whether you can create projects or only view. So hoping that it'll make things easier for those who are only getting started in Forma. Right. And that's that's the the, the rough uh, the, the rough take download in 41 minutes. That is efficient. Yes, so it was a lot to cover, I, I do realize, uh, and I think the pace will continue. And uh, I wanted to share a hack of where you can keep up with the product updates inside Forma. Again, if you click on the help menu, you will see news as one of the options in the window. And by clicking on news, you will see updates as communicated directly by the product teams explaining what's what, how to use it, and always linking to help articles with more detailed instructions. And this was kind of, I know it was a wave of stuff coming your way, and you're probably like, that, that's too much. Uh, so if there's anything you'd like to, to discuss in more detail, ask questions, I would invite you to join the, the community forums where me and Daria will be hanging out next week and making sure that if we can answer it, then somebody else jumps on and answers your questions. And as for this format, this is something we uh, have been wanting to do for the longest time. Mm. Uh, and we wanted to give you a chance or a time to just jump on and quickly rapid fire consume every update uh, so that you can keep up if you don't like reading, like, <laughs> like some architects don't. Um, but it's a it's an evolving and changing experience. This is the first time we're doing it. We obviously have technical issues and uh, maybe there are stuff we can do better. So leave that feedback in the community forum as well. And we'll uh, take that feedback with us for the next one, which is going to be in winter sometime, hopefully December, maybe January. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Thanks that's... everyone for tuning in and thanks for having me again. And thanks Carolina, Espen and Alice for hanging out in the queue. And I, I hope you uh, answered every question so, so we don't have to. <laughs> All right, thanks. everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. And please, you know, give us a shout. And let's keep the conversation going. Huh? Thank you. And catch you on the forums. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Bye.